to our uh, third session today on applying the break breakthrough therapy criteria in neurology. So uh, we had a lot of discussion this morning about uh, some of the issues and challenges in uh, the application of uh, the, the initial uh, experience with the breakthrough program, uh, that a lot of those applications were focused in oncology, which as we discussed uh, this morning between oncology, hematology, and virology uh, uh, has comprised the, 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 the bulk of the breakthrough designation activities so far. This afternoon we're going to switch gears and, and look at potential applications in other areas based on actual some actual experience, some hypothetical experience in other areas as well to determine whether there are different issues, whether there's need for further clarification uh, and uh, refinements about how the, the program is working, how the uh, criteria are working uh, in these other areas. So uh, similar kind of format to the previous session, we're going to have a, a real case and then we're going to have a, a hypothetical case that is based on experiences with uh, real cases that uh, uh, were not successful in uh, a, a breakthrough designation uh, grant, uh, and then some discussion around those cases as well. Uh, we'll start with an FDA presentation of, the, uh, of two case studies, uh, similar in format to how uh, the actual case studies would go or did go to the Medical Policy Council at, uh, at CEDAR. The first case study is a real-world example from Novartis. Uh, their drug, bimagrumab, targets sporadic inclusion body myositis. The second is a hypothetical denial case study that was developed by FDA. Uh, to handle these discussions, I'll start uh, again uh, uh, down at the, the far end. I think uh, it's uh, Dr. Ron Farkas, who's the clinical team lead in the Division of Neurology Products, will be uh, uh, presenting the cases. And uh, uh, next to uh, Dr. Farkas is Dr. Rob Kowalski, the global head of drug regulatory affairs and U.S. head of development for uh, Novartis. Uh, and then uh, uh, we've got uh, Dr. Maria Carrillo, who's the chief scientist officer for medical and scientific affairs uh, at the uh, Alzheimer's Association, Dr. Uh, Rajesh uh, Ranganathan, who's the director, Ranganathan, who's the director of the Office of Translational Research in the National Institute for Neurologic Disorders and Stroke at the National Institutes of Health, uh, and then next to me, Dr. Bob Temple, uh, who's the deputy director for clinical science at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. So uh, again, a, a great uh, panel to, to start this discussion. After their, their presentations and initial discussion, uh, we definitely want to have your participation uh, in this session uh, as well. So, uh, uh, Ron, if I could turn over to you for the case presentations. Hi, I'm Ron Farkas, a clinical team leader in the Neurology Division in the Office of New Drugs at uh, FDA. And this is a, uh, a presentation put together uh, with much help from Novartis, especially uh, many of these very uh, informative um, uh, figures and diagrams. Um, I, think, I think I want to say a couple of things before starting, and that is that really, I mean, maybe it's obvious uh, from some of the other things that have been said that the issues are different between the neurological diseases and the uh, oncology diseases. And I think that from this case and, and the hypothetical case that will be presented later, the main issue is did the drug do anything at all? And um, the, the field of oncology is far more advanced, and there's, there's issues about um, superiority to other uh, treatments. And so then we, when we start talking about a significant advance in a, in a condition that doesn't have any approved treatment, uh, then, then it's, it's kind of like a, a divided by zero uh, kind of uh, question. Um, the, the other thing is just the, the disease that I'm talking about today, it, it really isn't, I think, by chance that um, th I'm talking about this disease instead of ALS, or, or sorry, <laughs> Alzheimer's disease, or ALS for that matter, too. And, um, and this is a, this simple diagram here kind of, I think, um, it, it, it kind of, it, it communicates in a way that we, we know a lot, I think, about uh, what's going on uh, with muscles, about, uh, the way muscles might react to different factors, uh, the way that we might look at muscles to tell if there's a pharmacodynamic response, the way that the pharmacodynamic response 
could be matched with um, early evidence of a clinical response. So, so the knowledge is there to connect the dots so that, so that you know, there's the, the three legs of the stool to, to gain that confidence that, that there's an effect. So, so this drug, uh, bimagramab, is a, uh, a human monoclonal antibody uh, targeting activin type 2 uh, receptors. The, um, the other point, too, that I think is worth making is that the disease, um, sporadic inclusion body myositis, uh, it's, it's a muscle disease, um, but the, the, the cause of SIBM is not well understood. And the, the treatment that was developed for this disease, therefore, is not directed at the molecular cause of the disease. Of the disease. And, and that um, is what was not a major concern. And, and I only kind of thought about it at the last minute that, that well, of course, you know, we, we hear a lot about the importance of disease-modifying therapy, but actually, when we're thinking about effective therapy, we're, we're thinking about therapy that, that helps patients. And, um, and, and, and it, it is very gray, I think, uh, the difference between disease-modifying therapy and symptomatic therapy. And we, we don't, in the neurology division, really try to distinguish that, because if you can improve the way a patient is able to live their life uh, for the duration of their life, it, it becomes uh, quite a, a hypothetical question. So this disease, um, uh, it's, it's associated with aging. It's not very un well understood. Um, it's very slowly progressive, but it's slowly and, and, and consistently uh, progressive. And um, there are no approved treatments. So um, the acceptable clinical endpoints for a condition like this uh, are, are really, so, so this is a, a, a rare disease. It's a disease that doesn't have current, current drugs approved. And, and so there isn't an obvious, or perhaps there isn't an obvious endpoint favored by the FDA or an obvious endpoint that would be most sensitive. Uh, and uh, the way that the neurology division addresses this is looking at the, 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 the problems that the patients have and what would be clinically meaningful to the patient. And so we've listed some endpoints here, and we, we explain this to Novartis, we explain this to all the sponsors that come in, is that come, come to us with something that you think you can measure uh, that is important to the patients, and we'll figure out how to measure it um, reliably. And so here there's listed as possible endpoints, walking, uh, loss of uh, strength and function in the hands is a, a big problem in this disease. Dysphagia can be a problem. Um, and then secondary complications, I've listed uh, aspiration pneumonia, hospitalizations, falls, um, injuries, and perhaps most, most importantly, other endpoints could be acceptable. So the, um, the phase two study that was performed uh, was randomized, placebo-controlled, and double-blind. And I'll show the, show the data in just a minute, but especially in these small trials, knowledge about natural history does come in also. So there's a small control group, and th this was mentioned with oncology, that there is, uh, there is in the background uh, 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 an understanding that part of the interpretability of, of a very small study is consistency of the group and the control group with natural history. Uh, so there were 11 patients on the drug and only three on placebo. The primary outcome was um, thigh muscle volume, which is a, a biomarker. Um, the patients don't complain to the doctor, probably, that my thigh muscle volume is decreased. So that's something that it, it might, uh, might be a reasonable measure of something going on in the muscle, but it's not itself a a symptom that the patients have, or, or it's not in itself a clinical problem or something that's a clinical benefit. Um, secondary outcomes were six-minute walk distance, timed up and go, and uh, strength testing in lean uh, body mass. So again, sometimes the, um, the uh, distinction between something that is a symptom to the patient and something that uh, is, is kind of an indirect marker is, is a little bit gray. But 
One thing uh, that seems clear to the neurology division is that if patients can walk better, that that's going to mean benefit. Or again, we don't want it to say only walking the timed up and go test. That kind of thing is standing up from a chair. Um, uh, those are also something that if, if, if it's better enough for the patient to notice, that's clinically meaningful. Um, so the, the primary biomarker endpoint uh, in this very small study was, uh, was positive and, uh, you know, I have the p-value there, 0.02. But I think one thing uh, to stress is how, especially in these small studies, we have to remember what, what the limitations of p-values are and, and uh, that p-values I mean, not to get too much into the details, but p-values simply don't tell you if the drug works. They tell you the likelihood that what you're seeing just occurred by chance it, under certain very specific situations. So, so this presentation and the next one are kind of full of p-values, and, and, and we spend a lot of time talking uh, with sponsors and talking internally about p-values, but the p-values are, are really the, the, the greatest scientific invention ever to confuse and bewilder and mislead. <laughs> um, so one thing that we did, and it, it kind of came up before with oncology, is, is we took a look at, we asked uh, Novartis for some more data, and we took a look at the um, consistency of the data across the different patients. And so it says consistent increase ac across patients and plausible time course. And so these are all things that are not necessarily captured by the... Um, uh, by the p-value and, and that information we asked for and looked at and that really helped to uh, convince us in, 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 again, in the context of the science uh, that's known about uh, this, this mechanism uh, about uh, what might be going on. Um, the, um, the, excuse me. I can do that. There, there is a, um, I, I suppose there's, there's no, I suppose, therapeutic difference between slowing disease worsening and improving a patient's symptoms. W we, we wouldn't say that slowing the disease progression is, is any less important than improving symptoms, but, but especially when uh, considering evidence in the context of natural history, if symptoms improve, if abilities improve, if abilities improve, and that is not seen in the natural history of the, the disease, of course that can very much uh, contribute to, to evidence in, in a way that sometimes a slower decline, it's, it's harder to separate that from uh, variation in the natural history. So uh, I kind of mentioned the, um, the different legs of the stool to stand on or talking about standing so that it, it, it is um, it is important to have evidence of pharmaco pharmacodynamic effect uh, along with um, evidence of clinical benefit when, when evidence is, is very limited. And uh, it had been mentioned before the importance of other studies. And, um, and, and here we had a, another study showing the pharmacodynamic effect in, um, in healthy volunteers. And, and there are ways that we can uh, combine evidence from related studies, pharmacodynamic studies. Uh, this is, you know, well described in, in, in kind of larger terms in our guidance for efficacy. You can, you can combine um, uh, efficacy in, in diseases that are related to each other so that you only need to provide one study uh, for approval. It, it's something, something like that going on here too. If, if, if for the breakthrough designation we see uh, evidence from other studies that can support uh, the application will use that. I think this, this kind of summarizes what I said before and, and, and just at the bottom, again, the, to stress that, well, we would look for consistency of findings but not absolute consistency and we understand that uh, these are small trials and that um, if, if, if multiple findings are going in the right direction, obviously some findings uh, might not be, again, referring back to the magical p-value, might not be significant. 
So um, this first bullet point uh, that the, the program had already been discussed with FDA at, at the time the breakthrough designation request uh, came to us. And, and I mean, I think that's something that, that might come up during the discussion, but, but all along the interaction with the sponsor has been important. Um, You know, the, the sponsor had, had listed these, um, Novartis had listed these, these reasons, and um, you know, I, think, I think one thing uh, about the second bullet point, about more intensive FDA guidance um, and, and senior management, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll put in perhaps my discussion point uh, here, and, and that is that there was some uh, conversation about um, why uh, sponsors would uh, submit a breakthrough designation request, uh, maybe particularly if um, the data w was weak. And, um, and in the neurology division, um, well, sometimes it can be hard to schedule a meeting right within the time frames. We are available for consultation. And, and I think that I'll, I would just put in my plug that um, if, if the application, if there's significant doubt in the applicant's mind that the, the application would support breakthrough designation, and they want interaction with the division, probably the way to do that is, again, to, to call us or contact us through other methods and get interaction, uh, and, and we'll provide that. Um, and that, that'll be the most, most effective way to, 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 uh, to help the program along. These are uh, other points that the sponsor had um, uh, put up, and some of which I've, I've touched on. Um, the idea about substantial improvement on a clinically significant endpoint, uh, a lot of these diseases are rare. It is very important to uh, come and, and discuss with the division early uh, what kind of endpoints are gonna be selected because they're not always obvious from previous programs. And I think the other things I've already, I've already said. So I guess, um, I guess I'll just, I'm, I'm doing the second hypothetical case, so I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll get the nod and then I'll just continue with that. Um, so I, there's a lot of details in this presentation kind of to add color. Um, you know, it's a rare disease and there's some numbers and everything. I, I think that uh, there, isn't, there, there wasn't anything intended to be particularly important about 5,000 affected individuals. Um, and I, I think, too, uh, this last point, there's this kind of hypothetical um, disease that's serious and life-threatening. It's rare. It has characteristics that are somewhat similar to SIBM. Um, this drug is intended to uh, treat the genetic defect. But as I mentioned before, there isn't bias, there isn't preference about um, what the drug what level the drug is, is acting at. It's a similar kind of um, thinking about endpoints for this hypothetical disease. The um, appropriate endpoints would be symptoms that the patient has, symptoms meaning something that's a problem in just everyday activity. We, um, in neuro neurological diseases, uh, often the, the pathophysiology is not well understood. And um, while the previous example there was, um, there was a good case to be made for looking at, at what the muscle, muscle did, how much muscle there is, oftentimes in neurological diseases, um, especially at the biochemical level, uh, we don't think enough is understood for that to be uh, a significant support for uh, the efficacy of a drug. Again, it enti depends entirely on the disease, entirely case by case. But in the hypothetical case here, we wouldn't think there's enough information. So again, the details here don't matter exactly. Uh, for rare diseases, we typically have initial studies that are very small. This has 30 patients randomized to high dose, low dose, and placebo. The primary endpoint for early studies is often quite reasonably a, uh, a biochemical marker. 
even though it might not be a surrogate marker, it can guide dose selection, it can guide um, uh, knowledge that there is target engagement, that there is some effect of the drug. Um, secondary endpoints uh, are reasonable secondary endpoints uh, chosen for this example, pulmonary, uh, hand strength, a uh, patient-reported outcome of symptoms, and walking. And, and what's, what's very common in um, early studies is that the, the endpoints are not um, uh, ranked hierarchically for a statistical analysis. It's very common. Um, in some sense, it might be argued that the, the only thing that's necessary for a study to be interpretable as a primary endpoint, but I, I think that my plug at least would be that uh, for, for all that's at stake with these trials to get all the information out of them that you can, uh, it, it is important to uh, carefully pre-specify a statistical analysis plan even in the initial studies so that th then there's something to guide understanding of the results um, if everything didn't come out exactly as, as planned. So uh, the first bullet point here talks about differences across arms at baseline. And, and that, that, that has consequences uh, in interpreting everything that comes out of the studies. And, and one of the reasons that I mentioned um, uh, p-values as being um, a tool but, but not to be over-interpreted is that particularly in, in small studies, we're talking 10 patients per arm, um, randomization isn't magic. It doesn't make the arms equal just because you randomize. And, and differences between the arms at baseline uh, can lead to differences between the arms at the end of the study. And, and the p-value, if it's low, it can reflect that there's differences, but it, it, it might not be reflecting that there's differences due to drug. It might be reflecting that there's differences due to, to unequal randomization. And there's really no way to quantify that, too. I should say there's, there's, there's no sound argument uh, that um, if the imbalances are not statistically significant, that uh, that means they don't have an effect on the final p-value. Um, so in this example, low dose showed no efficacy. In high dose, um, the primary biomarker, biomarker endpoint was negative. And then, and then there's... In this example, a scattering of um, p-values for the clinical endpoints, and this is even perhaps worse than we sometimes might see. There's a 0 0.02, 0 0.07, but the 0.24, and then one endpoint, functional vital, vital capacity, was, there was numerical inferiority. So it suggests a random process, but it wouldn't necessarily have to. Um, these, uh, another example could have been given where the p-values were, um, were all leading towards the drug, but, but how much independent evidence they provide of efficacy is kind of questionable. They, if they were all due to unequal randomization, their baseline differences, and they're all correlated with each other, they're, they're all reflecting that same uh, process. So, so, so that's the kind of thinking that we go through to try to understand the meaning of individual p-values and p-values uh, combined. Now, one thing that we, we see sometimes um, is kind of a subgroup, post hoc subgroup analysis. Um, and um, especially in, in small studies, uh, if, you, if you take a group of 10 people and divide it into a group of five people, um, we, we think that there is, um, there's always a way, or almost always a way, to find uh, some group that did better, some half that did better than the other half. And, 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 and so um, this is a great way to generate hypotheses. Um, maybe that, that other group did do better uh, that had the lower p-value. But uh, as far as supporting breakthrough designation, um, we're not able to separate that from, from chance. The, um, what to do with a, a, a negative biomarker finding is, is, is kind of often difficult. Um, laboratory studies fail for a number of reasons. We deal with a lot of rare diseases where methods are still being developed. 
um, it's possible that the, the test hasn't been developed well enough um, to be reliably conducted. Uh, but it's still something that is worrisome if the pharmacodynamic effect of the drug hasn't been demonstrated. Another um, issue is what's the best endpoint? And, and, and uh, these studies are often done in an exploratory fashion to try to identify what the best endpoint is. Uh, if you see that in this example, dynamometry uh, had the smallest p-value, that would be hypothesis generating. Um, but after the fact, it doesn't provide reliable evidence that that's the, the p-value that we should look at at the exclusion of the others. I think I addressed the other point. I thought there were more slides. Um, Help with the, there we go. Okay, thank you. So this idea came up before during the oncology section about trying to rescue a study. Um, and uh, it's just kind of worth repeating, I, I think, that um, in the neurology division with these rare diseases, we're really trying to make the distinction between is there any evidence of efficacy versus no evidence of efficacy. And, and we're, really, we're really at, at the grayest area. Uh, these studies are often submitted when uh, there is um, real thought that needs to be given if there's, there's any evidence of efficacy at all. And, and again, just to make that, I think maybe I've already made the point, but um, when, when all the parts don't fit together, when, when there's weaknesses in the study, uh, uh, when they're so small, and when there's so little data, um, it, it, it shifts into that area of no evidence of efficacy, no interpretable, no reliable evidence of efficacy. Uh, and again, we, we see these, I'm, I'm not, um, I guess, creating this case out of um, an abundance of worry. This, this is not atypical, or was intended to be not atypical of many of the submissions that we get. Anyway, I think I, uh, I had covered all those other points, so I, I went through them quickly so we'd have more time for discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Ron, for covering both of those cases and giving a sense, as you said at the end, of uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, data and issues that you're often dealing with in, in neurology. Um, I do want to get a, a few different perspectives on this. Let me start by turning um, to uh, Rob uh, for the Novartis side of the the first case experience, and um, Rob, we heard a little bit already from uh, Ron about some of the um, uh, thing, some of the thinking that led to your wanting to participate in this program. Uh, um, you know, in, in particular, we, we talked a, a bit about the opportunity, or Ron mentioned the opportunity for some more intensive uh, FDA engagement, including some of the senior management engagement. And uh, um, I think also on the slide was that the breakthrough designation could help raise awareness about the, uh, the, the uh, studies for uh, the, this condition. Uh, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about why you applied and and um, uh, any key issues in your experience with, uh, uh, with Breakthrough. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and thanks, Ron, for presenting the case well. There's a couple things that we looked at when we considered BTT status, or as I call it, BTT, you call it BT. Um, but we had already had our clinical program more or less agreed to. But I think what's unique here, there are some aspects that are relevant to orphan diseases, and there's others that are also applicable to non-orphans. So as we were looking for a case for this meeting, this one offers a couple nice flavors of both. Um, because it is such a rare disease, if you ask the general physician, most of them don't know what SIBM is, and so we, we did also want to have, is a more of an unintended consequence we hadn't thought of proactively, but we got some great press off of getting the designation, and it actually really drew a lot of patients into our clinical trials. 
um, because it, it caught some uh, general press and that sort of thing. So it was actually very helpful from that perspective. So it could be another element, unintended consequence from getting the designation, especially in orphan diseases. But for us, what's unique here is that, and this is irregardless of the orphan designation, is that this is an area of unchartered clinical and regulatory science. Nobody really knows what the right endpoint is, and so it is something that we have to design together with the agency and with academia to try to find out what is the best way to measure this. And so we had some challenges around what is the natural history of the disease, there's no good natural history data, and trying to put all these different pieces together. And it was, it was clear to us that we were going to have to pave the regulatory and clinical path here. And BTT, BT quite naturally allows us to do that much closer together uh, in a partnership as we design through this area. Um, I think when we had asked the agency, you know, will this, will this uh, um, be eligible for breakthrough status, I think at the, the meeting we were at, I think the answer to summarize was, we're not sure, but submit it and we'll look at it. Because we clearly are, are trying to go th into an area that nobody really knows what is the right endpoint. And there was quite a, a bit of back and forth during the review of the, of the breakthrough therapy designation, asking for natural history data and other things to actually put that bigger clinical picture together. Right, Ron? I mean, I think that's, they were trying to make the decision on the totality of evidence, not just on one or two endpoints. So it had to do with natural history, data from healthy volunteer studies that we had, and those things to actually bring the totality of evidence um, really to bear. So I think if you look at it beyond that as a good lessons learned, when you're looking at these things, it don't just look at the, the key data you had, or as Ron said, your p-value in your one study that you think gets you there, but it's really the totality that goes beyond that that helps make the case, especially in areas where there is no comparator or there's no good natural history. It becomes a bit more of art than it does, I think, necessarily hard, hard science, although there's clearly hard science here. Yeah, so, although, although I mean, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but, yeah. I, but I, I guess that the, 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 the way you describe art, that, that is science, and yes. you know, that, yeah. that combining of information, even though it's not numerical, that's, yes. I, I think, the way we try to look at the science. Thanks for the comments, and I'd like to turn to Bob next. Uh, uh, I think you're on this panel, Bob, uh, for at least a couple of reasons that I'd like to bring into the discussion. One is that uh, you're a medical policy council representative, so you can provide that perspective on how this fits into the, the overall strategy at CEDAR on uh, approaching, um, as we heard about this morning, consistent implementation of breakthrough designation. But uh, also, even your, your um, leadership on the, the statistical analysis issue, I mean, these are some, you know, some hard evidence problems because we're talking about, as, as you heard, small numbers, uh, early stage, and this isn't, you know, not as much as at stake as as, as, uh, as the approval of the drug itself, but this is an important determinant, of, as you heard in this case, of uh, uh, the uh, FDA putting some additional resources in, into it, maybe getting some more clarification sooner, some more uh, clarity around what would make for uh, good endpoints in those uh, in the uh, uh, registration or other trials for approval that probably wouldn't have happened as fast or in the same way as, as happened here. So, so um, you know, if, you're, if this is going to significantly influence what the agency does, uh, um, you, you do want to interpret the, the very limited evidence as, as effectively as possible. So if you could maybe comment from either or both of those perspectives, I'd appreciate it. Well, as, as uh, John indicated, somewhat to our surprise, people have been interested in getting breakthrough therapy as a late thing after they've done all the studies, even when the application's already in place. And there are benefits from that. You know, you, we can uh, make sure the chemistry gets done and all that kind of thing, and it sometimes focuses things. But our original thought was that the main benefit would be to design the trials early, properly, and we've expressed an interest in doing that a long time. Our subpart E regulations did it uh, decades and decades ago. I've always sort of believed that breakthrough therapy was how we implemented the subpart E, which we never really did anything about. We expressed it as a wish, but we never really did anything about it. And now this says, we're going to do it. You're going to meet with us. We're going to tell you what we think. We'll get high-level people in where, uh, where that can help. And all of those things seem really the most important things. After all, doing a, a program better early can save five years. Getting the chemistry right can maybe save you six months. So. They're all valuable, but the great place is here. And on a disease where there's never been a treatment, 
you really do want to think through what the endpoints will be. I don't think it's usually impossible if somebody can walk better and, uh, you know, and their PRO shows they're happier with their life. That's not that hard a call. But you still want to agree. It turns out there are frequently arguments about whether this PRO is a good enough PRO and stuff like that. You want to get those arguments done and out of the way. And it's not that we wouldn't do that ordinarily, but this sort of forces attention to it, makes us commit to doing it, we're, we're monitoring ourselves and all that. So the, 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 the idea behind it is very solid, and you heard from Ron all, all the different kinds of endpoints there were, and people need to know if I win on one endpoint, is that good enough? Should I have a supportive one? Will the marker alone, you know, will, will muscle volume alone do it? Um, that's not obvious. You don't know that until you gain agreement. So all of those things are very much worth talking about. Um, we also are interested in just how to do the early statistical analyses, and sometimes it does help to know what the natural history is, know how variable it is, how, how uh, diverse it is. Um, I admit that uh, uh, mere, mere clinicians as opposed to statisticians don't always understand the nuances of all these analyses, but to me the p-value is a reasonable measure of how likely it is this was a chance occurrence and whether you should be very likely to believe it or not. Um, and as, as uh, Ron said, if you fail on your initial analyses and then find a subgroup, that's not very credible at all. I mean, uh, I, I once heard uh, Richard Pito defined uh, intelligence as the speed with which you can discover that what you thought was true is wrong and that the opposite was true. How soon you can come to believe that. He, he, he thought faster meant you were smart. Um, so that's really what I would say. The, the case here for negativity is, you know, you could say it's a little marginal. They won on some of the endpoints, but it wasn't consistent. And all of those things should have gone the right way if you're doing what you think you did. So the case that this is not strong enough, it seems to me, was quite strong in that, in that one. So it's, it's a good example. And as I keep saying, I wish everybody could see all of the cases that we turned down to get some better idea of how we put these things together. And as John's been saying from the beginning, these are matters of judgment. They're not usually open and shut. Um, and sometimes we have internal debates about some of them. And you know, how, how much should a borderline clinical uh, finding be outweighed by the fact that you did exactly what you thought you should do on the biomarker? Does that get you there or almost get you there? Anyway, those are all complicated questions. So I think these were very nice examples of how we should do it. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Bob. And uh, Rajesh, I'm going to turn to you next on uh, your thoughts about lessons here that could be relevant to the work at um, the, the uh, Institute for Neurologic Disorders and Stroke or at uh, NCATS, for, for that matter, and trying to uh, help uh, move treatments along. Uh, um, if uh, uh, these two cases, the real one and the hypothetical one, are, uh, are, are at all indicative of neurology, uh, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty as, as uh, Bob pointed out, about uh, how exactly to, to demonstrate that uh, a, a promising treatment really works. No, thank you, Mark. So I guess uh, in, uh, this has been a learning experience for me today, sitting through these uh, discussions, uh, since I work a little bit in the earlier phase of uh, uh, therapy development before things come to the stage of essentially requesting this kind of designation. So for me, I think the, what, what has been a thread both in the morning discussion but also the presentations this uh, uh, that uh, that Ron made is, I guess, the importance of thinking about the uh, ensuring that we are developing uh, whatever the therapeutic might be, antibody, small molecule, uh, regardless of the modality, is going to uh, focus on developing a pharmacodynamic readout that can be um, measured both in the preclinical setting, but then also subsequently in the clinical setting. That's going to give a reasonable. Uh, confidence that the drug is working the way you expect it to, and uh, give an indication of target engagement and the other, and drive dose selection uh, when it comes to the patient population. So in many of the, many of the programs that we have recently launched in, in neurology, we've emphasized that as sort of the, you know, uh, different three, different stool, different three legs, but, you know, one of the legs of the stool uh, being that sort of pharmacodynamic marker, uh, being part of the, uh, the process that folks are doing, um, uh, are thinking carefully about. Uh, the, the other point I guess I would make is, um, 
you know, what, one of the things we, and this may be colored a little bit by my former uh, sort of pharma experience, which was also at Novartis uh, before this, and before coming to the NIH, is uh, sort of when folks are thinking about developing therapies to essentially uh, sort of think about that end goal, think about what it is you're actually trying to do and what you're trying to, um, uh, ha you know, make happen in the patient or help the patient with. And that sort of drives your plan. And so to the, to the extent that that clinical perspective can be uh, incorporated earlier into the process, even in terms of thinking about what the, or what the primary endpoint might be, a secondary endpoint might be, I think really informs what it is we end up developing. And so, and, and so it's not always easy to do this because most of the time we have academic investigators who've done their R01 work who start to stumble into sort of something that might be interesting and then start working on developing a therapy. Um, we, we push and challenge them to essentially get together with the clinical counterparts to get that, get that input. And we have, we have interactions with the CBER side, at least through an MOU, where we get that uh, input uh, on a quarterly basis on projects that we do. Uh, it, would be, you know, it would be great to continue having that kind of input or, or enhance the, the input on, on the small molecule side as well or the CEDAR side as well. Because I think uh, to the extent that we, we learn what, the, what, the, what our you know, sister organization, the FDA, is looking for, we can then better tailor our, our grant programs to ensure that the taxpayer investment gets, gets people to the place where it's actually going to uh, make a difference. You asked about NCATS, so I guess I'll make one comment there. So obviously NCATS, the bulk of NCATS is, uh, while I'm not part of it, I know a fair bit about it from, from previous activities. Um, a large amount of NCATS's investment goes into these Clinical and Translational Science Awards, or CTSAs, that are 60 plus uh, centers across the nation. And Petra Kaufman, who went from NINDS to head that up, uh, she's been in that role for almost a year now, you know, really sort of thinking about how these, these st stage trials can be done, not just for neurology, but for all diseases uh, that, uh, that, might, uh, that, 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 uh, that could be uh, potentially uh, sort of structured through these uh, clinical centers. I think these kinds of ideas could be well, perhaps there's a component of education that could be um, transmitted uh, now beyond a meeting of this sort through those kinds of activities that the clinical, uh, that, that the CTSAs have. So that's the comment I would make there. Uh, Thank th you. Thanks very much, Rajesh. And uh, Maria, if I could, uh, could turn to you, obviously um, Alzheimer's disease was not one of the conditions that was the subject of these two cases, and it's certainly not an orphan uh, condition. Um, at least as it's understood today, uh, but uh, some of the other issues that have come up in terms of um, uh, very limited availability of existing treatments and questions about the, the best way to demonstrate that a treatment is effective are certainly seem relevant there. Do you have some thoughts about the uh, relevance of uh, the, the breakthrough experience so far in neurology to uh, Alzheimer's? Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting us here because it is something um, that I think will hopefully change in Alzheimer's disease in our landscape in the next, maybe even in this decade. We're, we're very hopeful about what we're looking at today. But I, I can say that certainly, um, as was said earlier, Alzheimer's disease is uh, a disease that's recognized uh, as having a huge unmet need. Um, there, are, um, there are medications available today, FDA-approved medications, that uh, can uh, give uh, patients a improvement, um, sometimes for a short period of time, according to patients, sometimes for a longer period of time, as people stay on them for years and years. Uh, and, uh, but it's, it's also really um, good to see that it's recognized, uh, you know, by the community at large, I think, not only our community of, of patients and families, but um, I think the academic community, the scientific community and industry, uh, and even at the federal government level, that this is uh, a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, I think even as the Alzheimer's Association created the bill for what's called the National Alzheimer's Project Act, and was, that was passed unanimously in 2011, since then, our federal agencies have actually been working together um, incredibly well uh, uh, out of the uh, HHS, the so Secretary Burwell's um, uh, FACA committee on uh, the national plan to address Alzheimer's. So we're, we're really hopeful um, that all of that is gonna line, align uh, for us. And, and I think this, this type of meeting is a, is a part of that, certainly. So we're very pleased to participate in that. Um, you know, we, we do have, um, I'm learning a lot from the oncology area. I think that was a great discussion earlier. And uh, we have biomarker envy, certainly. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And we wish we had some of the things that we were able to measure in oncology that give us reasonable um, evidence, or as their agnostics even, that, that our medications are working. Uh, but we don't have that. And I think it was mentioned earlier that Alzheimer's disease is now feared more than cancer. 
Um, it is not uncommon to hear our patients and families talk about um, wanting to die of something else uh, before their symptoms progress, um, which can go as long as 20 years, um, leaving a person maybe with 15 years of unrecognizing either themselves or others. Um, so that is really uh, not acceptable as a condition. I myself have someone in my family who's living this way, and it's been seven years already, and I can see that we are in this for the long haul because she is very healthy, other than what's happening in her, in her brain. But uh, I think one of the most challenging things that we have uh, been facing has really changed recently with um, the advent of the collaboration that we had with the National Institute on Aging and the Alzheimer's Association, where we put forward a new framework for how to think about Alzheimer's disease much earlier than we do today. Because today when, we come, when, a, when, a, when a person comes to their physician and gets a diagnosis, you know, they've probably lived with Alzheimer's for something like 15 years, maybe even more. And so just putting that uh, notion out there into the scientific community that we can actually perhaps detect biological markers for Alzheimer's years, decades before um, these, these uh, symptoms uh, occur uh, is, is, was a huge seed change. And since then, I think we've made so many advances in um, being able to think about biomarkers a little bit differently uh, and having a little bit more maybe confidence in, in the fact that we can reliably measure them. I think one of the disadvantages we have that it, oncology and other diseases don't have, um, like even the example that was given by Ron, um, is, uh, is that our biomarkers right now are nonspecific to Alzheimer's. Um, they are biomarkers of one or two of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, but unfortunately they can exist in other dementias as well, and so they are not specific. Um, still, we're looking for ways to measure them over time, um, try to support longitudinal studies and embedding these biomarkers in clinical studies that sponsors uh, are launching, and they are, certainly. Um, my colleague here, Rob, uh, to my right, sponsoring one of the very larger ones in the, in the prevention space uh, that will be very significant and hopefully launching by the end of 2015 or early 2016. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an exciting time to be able to do that. Um, but again, unless we do those, unless we have those types of investments, it's really not going to be possible for us to see how um, we can uh, it confidently perhaps approach something like even a breakthrough designation. Now, I, I don't know because it's not uh, clear, as Bob Temple said, uh, who, how many... Uh, um, how many programs have come through the FDA uh, and have been uh, denied status because we don't know those, that information. We do know that, as far as I know, and I've connected with uh, Dr. Katz as well, who's, as you know, recently retired as head of the Division of Neurology Products, and there haven't been any successful ones for Alzheimer's disease, and we all know this. And so I think this is um, one of our challenges. Uh, and I think the other end point that we ha have a huge challenge with is cognition. Uh, I think and all of you uh, who are familiar with Alzheimer's disease know that cognition changes very slowly, and thinking about being able to measure a significant change in cognition in six months is really challenging. The field is trying to do that now. We're trying to develop better cognitive outcome measures so that if we do have a biological marker, we can actually perhaps see a clinical benefit in a shorter amount of time than 18 months, uh, and perhaps even in a smaller trial than uh, 3,000 in a phase three, or even 800 or 200 uh, in a phase two. So these are some of the challenges we face, uh, and that cognitive outcome measure is still not there. Um, we're working with a lot of different divisions on that, um, certainly um, the sealed and uh, uh, biomarker qualification processes are a part of this. Uh, we're working with, directly with the Division of Neurology Products on this. So there's a lot of work being done, um, but we're certainly still in learning mode, and this has been a phenomenal learning experience for me as well, uh, because as you can imagine, we talk to a lot of, a lot of companies, we talk to a lot of uh, cognition companies as well, as therapeutic companies and diagnostic companies, and we ourselves support quite a number of those to, in order to try to accelerate this process and be, uh, you know, as, as the, be the best partners we can be to the federal agencies um, along this challenging ride. So thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Rob. You had uh, something to add? Yes, yeah, I have a question, and it's, it's not necessarily linked just to Alzheimer's, but I'm sitting here thinking, and, and that's a question for Bob or for Ron, around what do we do in trying to get a breakthrough therapy designation in those diseases like Alzheimer's where we just don't yet have the early biomarkers, and we don't know whether it works until the end of phase three? How do we have the discussion? Maybe there's no chance, right, because that's not how BTD is designed, but any, any thoughts about that? You mean, how do you get breakthrough when there's nothing to show? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, frankly, a discussion we have sometimes, um, and there are various positions on it, is the extent to which some kind of very plausible marker might be a basis for breakthrough. In general, we're reluctant to do that because the, the words in the, in the rule are, are clinical. Um, but I don't 
personally think, and yeah, I'm somewhat on the side of the potential for a bar biomarker to be the basis for, uh, for breakthrough. Um, uh, I don't think it's out of the question that something very impressive uh, uh, could do that. On the other hand, you got to be nervous. There have been a whole bunch of drugs that decreased amyloid and made people worse. So if you want, if you want to get nervous, that's a reason to get nervous. Um, I did want to mention that one of the things that can be improved is the nature of the initial study. There are en enrichment features that you could use to find a population that is, say, more likely to progress. I mean, you have a bunch of people; they may have a little bit of uh, a little bit of impairment. Um, if you may be able to know from uh, evaluation of large databases how to predict who's going to progress faster, a crucial element in any, in any given trial. It's not out of the question that there could be early markers that would convince you that this is a person who might respond. That's a very good use for biomarkers. You know, you, you put people on for a week and you only take the people who seem to respond and you randomize them and you don't waste your time on the others. So there are these enrichment maneuvers, which is absolutely one of the things we want to talk to people about early. Uh, it's not going to be possible all the time, but it's worth thinking about. And better data on natural history is the key to a lot of that stuff, for, for at least for prognostic enrichment. So we're very enthusiastic about that. Uh, and Maria? Um, the only the other thing I wanted to mention is that we've been, um, you know, certainly enrichment strategies are absolutely critical in that. Um, I think actually the, the trial Novartis will launch will, it has an, uh, an enrichment um, tool embedded in it, and as do many others. Um, but one of the things that the FDA has been phenomenal with, uh, in particular the Division of Neurology Products, is that they did issue a draft guidance um, some time ago acknowledging uh, the fact that uh, these biomarkers are. Uh, certainly have enough evidence now to be believable uh, to a certain extent. And even opening the door to potential, um, you know, surrogate biomarker status in the future, if you can demonstrate some type of clinical benefit, even if it's early on. So there are, uh, there is an, uh, an opening of that door. We, there's a wedge in there. So, I mean, we're, we're hoping to follow the oncology example and start with that small signal and, and blow that wide open. But uh, we're moving in that direction. So we're, we're really pleased by that. Let me add to that. I mean, in, in people who have modest degrees of impairment, you can detect uh, an improvement in, in delay and impairment. But what you really want to do with Alzheimer's is stop it before it starts uh, and get to people who don't have anything. They don't have minimal cognitive impairment. They don't have anything except some marker that they're going to get it, a bad, bad genome or something like that. So it doesn't seem out of the question that once there was evidence that you could affect people who were further along, markers and surrogates might become possible. Doing that without some evidence that it actually benefits seems a stretch, uh, given the, the error rate so far. But, but the, those things are all on our mind. The whole point is to keep it from happening. We know that. And, and you're right. Everybody in the agency is very worried about this. Yeah. Um, we have a few minutes for comments or questions, if anyone has any. So just like uh, we did in the morning sessions, uh, please head up to the uh, to the microphones if you do. Um, I'm going to use uh, this chance, if we, if we do have another minute, uh, without questions from the audience, to push on, you know, um, push on this notion of, of when breakthrough applies and how it fits with uh, other approaches that can help focus efforts early on clarifying a, a pathway to getting treatments where none exist. Uh, so uh, uh, Rick Pazner was quoted as saying this morning that uh, breakthrough is about transformational therapies. Uh, and uh, in oncology, we had a lot of examples and, and markers and, uh, and uh, mechanism science to help uh, guide all of that. Uh, in neurology, we're in a really different world. And I was kind of struck by Bob's initial comments and this further discussion, really uh, focusing on the challenge of in rare diseases uh, uh, where there are no treatments or, or diseases uh, um, like Alzheimer's are more common, but where the, the pathway for, for demonstrating effects is maybe a bit unclear, uh, that, that the purpose of breakthrough is even more about clarifying sort of a, a breakthrough pathway to demonstrating whether or not a treatment is a breakthrough or not. Uh, um, there, as uh, Francis Collins likes to say, there's something like, I've lost count now, but 8,000 diseases and only 10% uh, or fewer of them with treatments, and a lot of those seem to be falling in the uh, in the neurology area, especially the rarer ones. And Bob, from your comments, it seems like in this area in particular, um, breakthrough seems to be having a role of focusing uh, the FDA in working with sponsors and to do things. I think what you said was, yeah, we, we've always said we wanted to do this. Well, now we've got a good reason to. Are people actually developing a drug that may be coming along? But this seems like a little bit different um, 
uh, maybe it's just emphasis, but a little bit different uh, kind of application of breakthrough than what we talked about this morning in, uh, uh, in uh, oncology. And if you want to comment on that further. You may have to explain further. I, I think most people think that anything that changes any of these relentlessly progressive diseases is pretty hot right stuff, yeah. is, tra is transformational. Even if the, even if the evidence is really, uh, is really limited without validated biomarkers on small populations. No, I wasn't talking about the evidence. I was talking about the magnitude of the effect. What the, the, the point that Rick made that you said was, you know, for example, if you increase the if you increase the response rate from ten percent to twelve percent, nobody's particularly excited. It should be it should be a, a giant step. In in all of these diseases, which by their characteristics are all relentlessly progressive and never give up at all, uh, you know, a, a measurable delay usually seems like a pretty important thing. And it doesn't have to make the disease go away. It doesn't have to cure them. I think we're ready to find uh, any documented improvement, uh, pretty impressive. Whether you're measuring it by uh, your ability to squeeze things or your ability to walk faster and things like that. I mean, you know, uh, we, we've used uh, improved six minute walk as a measure for a whole bunch of neurologic diseases. Someone could say, does that mean it changes your life? And we would say, well, it corresponds to changing your life. So we, we like those, but I, I don't know, I'd be interested in what Ron says. I think documenting an improvement in these things where there is nothing is generally taken as a pretty good thing. Um, you know, and saying, oh, well, yeah, but it's too small to matter would be unusual in these cases. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything. And, and the, the breakthrough designation, I think, does help the public understand uh, the, the, the bar, if you will, that the neurology division has set for uh, uh, Supporting um, the development and approval of drugs that 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 patients know might not be a cure, but but that provide uh, that potentially provide benefit that would be important to them just for the reasons that that Bob mentioned, and and I think that in in all the discussion, and I, I kind of tried stressing too, in all the discussion uh, this morning of um, oncology and improvement over existing therapy. There's, there's a lot of um, terms and words about uh, uh, superiority or the size of benefit, and uh, that, that can cause <coughs> confusion, even in experienced investigators in, in neurology, about what, um, what the neurology division's requirements are uh, for approval or, or for, for breakthrough designation. And, and, and again, just to, to, to reiterate what, what Bob said, that we're looking for things uh, to, to, to support that um, that might, might just allow somebody to, to walk farther or uh, hold, hold a, a, a water glass better. Great. Uh, go ahead, Maria. You know, I think the only thing I would add that I, is, is one fear that we've heard re very recently, and, um, and it is that uh, I think, you know, Bob, I thank you for those comments because we believe, you know, coming from a science-based advocacy group that we, we want any small measure. And I think uh, all of us feel the same way in this, in this field as we work together on this, that. We, we want, we want, we'll take anything at this point, but we, we're, we're striving for uh, the ultimate prevention, absolutely. Um, but one of the things we, that, that it does make people nervous is, for example, um, and I know this is not the topic of this meeting, but the reimbursement angle. So that, that then becomes an, a different issue on the other side. And um, I think when we think about amyloid imaging in particular and, and uh, the CMS's decision to cover under evidence development for something that FDA approved, uh, it's, it's something that makes people think a little bit about um, meaningfulness and how much how much of an effect is enough. So all of that is is I think still under consideration and makes people nervous. But we, we're certainly in agreement with with your comments. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank our panel for a really good discussion on a really challenging set of issues. Thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon. We're going to go right into our next panel. So if I could ask uh, the, the panelists for session four on uh, applying breakthrough therapy criteria in some other areas.